sending positive vibes to all truth seekers. Welcome to the Library of Humanity podcast. Today we're looking at Kundalini. What is it and how can it help you become enlightened? I found an online book in PDF form called Kundalini Energy by a man named Swami Satyananda Saraswati. He sounds pretty smart by his title. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a lot from my notes, my copious notes that I took from that book, and I'm going to be reading mostly directly from him because he is the expert and I am the student. And you have the opportunity to learn more and more about Kundalini and the science of enlightenment. Okay, Kundalini Yoga. Kundalini Yoga is the science of enlightenment. Kundalini Yoga is one way to become enlightened out of many, many options. I see enlightenment as kind of like a buffet. You can try a little bit of this and a little bit of that. A little bit of a warning is that with Kundalini, it is just a map of the territory, okay? Any belief system is a map of the territory. But the thing is, Kundalini Yoga is one of the best maps that you can find in order to become enlightened. And so today, what we're gonna look at is Swami Satyananda Saraswati and his words of wisdom about Kundalini. What is it, for example? Today, he says, Today, man has mastered the material dimension, the energy of Prakriti, and discovered the mysteries of nature. Now, through the process of Kundalini, man should become master of the spiritual dimension. So here's a little taste of what the book is going to look like. And... A little, another little warning is that you're going to hear a lot of wor- Indian words that, are, that comes from the language uh, called Sanskrit. Sanskrit is kind of like the Latin of Europe, and it's the ancient language of the Indian subcontinent. Okay, And there can be pure experience when the mind and body are turned off. Okay, So Kundalini is looking at going beyond the mind and the body. There is only an outside world because we believe it and we were taught so. (laughs) The outside world is an illusion, ultimately. You were taught that there is an outside world outside of your, your own subjective experience. The truth is deeper than your, sen- than your sense of who you are as a human person. So you have to go beyond your personhood to see ultimate truth. An observed object is not necessary to be conscious. So it's possible just to be conscious. For example, in deep sleep, when you don't remember that you slept, right? that is pure consciousness. So there's the three stages. There's a, when you're awake, there's when you're dreaming, and when you're in deep sleep. The deep sleep state is when you're in pure consciousness. But because we have not awakened our kundalini, that's the, the idea is we have not, that we cannot experience the pure consciousness uh, because we're not enlightened or have samadhi. So the word samadhi is going to be synonymous with enlightenment. The belief we have of our minds actually limits its possibility. Very, very important. So we, there's unlimited possibility from your mind. So you have to start using it as a tool. Samadhi is not quitting the world, it's actually incorporating the world and seeing what it truly is. Okay, at this point in the, in the video, it's a great, this is a great opportunity to teach you the seven chakras. Okay, the seven chakras, this is going to be the actual map of kundalini energy. Okay, so what I'm going to, I'm going to teach you the seven chakras and their, their Sanskrit name and then their English name. So you, you don't have to remember the Sanskrit name, but it's very important to remember the English name for these. Again, there are seven, and what they are are spiritual energy points in your body. Okay, so the first one, the Sanskrit name is Mula, Muladhara. Muladhara is also called the root chakra, and we're going to learn where that chakra is, but it's at the bottom of your spine, so, uh, near, um, near, near your butt. <laughs> The next one is a little hard to pronounce, Svadishtana, Svadishtana, I think that's okay. The second, so that's the second chakra, the sacral chakra, chakra. 
and that is the English word. Then the third chakra is just the third chakra, and that's going to be behind your belly button. The fourth chakra is one of the most important ones. Uh, the Indian term is anahata, and we're going to call that the, sh the heart chakra. Very important. The heart chakra, that's going to be where you find unlimited, infinite love. The number, number five is uh, vishuddha. That's called a throat chakra. So right here, this gives you the ability to speak your mind. Number six, the most important chakra uh, is called the third eye, right here, your third eye. Um, it's called Ajna in Sanskrit. And then the seventh one at the top of your head is called Sahasrara, but we're going to call it the crown chakra. So when, when this opens up, that's when you really, really experience an awakening experience called Samadhi. So you begin to enter Samadhi when your crown chakra opens and the kundalini energy is rising from down below up so it goes from the first chakra near your butt all the way up your spine that's where the fluid the the spiritual fluid that's what the words they call it are going to rise up towards your chakra towards your crown chakra and this is by entering the new realm of pureness okay kundalini the definition is a dynamic potential force in the material body. So it's actually found in our material bodies. How science is currently structured cannot explain kundalini awakenings. Extremely important. How the scientific method is currently set up, it cannot explain kundalini awakenings. So kundalini awakenings are science, are in addition to science. So they are, yes, incorporate science, that's great, but it's like, it's in addition to, right? It's like, it's like you, pay, you pay your bill at the restaurant, but the Kundalini awakening is the tip. It's just extra, right? So quote, so quote, now I get to quote from uh, Satyananda Saraswati, um, his direct words. Previously, I was using my own words. So quote, if this awakening is to become a universal event, then the entire social structure has to be reorganized and millions of people all over the world have to be told the purpose of their existence. Quote, the purpose of expanding the mind and opening new doors of experience. It is impossible to awaken unless one has become aware of something more than what his parents and society could give him. So the idea is you have to go beyond what society deems is true. You have to go beyond it. You have to be willing to question it. Formerly, there were only a few seekers, but now millions and millions of people in the world are striving for a higher experience. So that's why we can use the internet to talk about enlightenment and awakenings through YouTube. That's exactly why I'm here. It may be difficult for people of today to understand the whole concept, but soon humanity will comprehend it all. Matter or substance will become unnecessary and insignificant. So the future of humanity is consciousness, not material. <laughs> Quote, you should not try to realize and experience these things abruptly. You have to be patient. You will find here detailed instructions on the gradual preparation of your mind and body for the arousal of kundalini and advice on elementary precautions to be observed in order to avoid unnecessary risks and obstacles. So kundalini yoga is quite risky, and I'm going to dive into details of that. Um, and you don't want to do it too fast. Do not try to influence your mind directly, because the mind is nothing but an extension of the body. Very important. Your mind is not what wakes you up. It is the universe. Many people encouraged by this type of philosophy take drugs, chemicals, and other things they consider to be speedy alternatives. They are very serious people, I believe, but they are not practical and systematic because they think they have that they can transcend the, transcend the role of the body in the realm of evolution. In the final evolution of mind, matter, and man, you cannot ignore either the body or the mind. You cannot even ignore the nose, the stomach, or the digestive system. So don't ignore any part of your body. That's what's going to wake you up. Where does the experience generate from? From heaven? No. 
from this body and this nervous system. So the seven chakras are basically the nervous system. You can sustain this great awakening and integrate it into a more conscious and creative way of life. And here's the warning. A kundalini experience can make you physically ill. That's why you have to seek a kundalini teacher, a certified or a trustworthy kundalini teacher. Kundalini is not a myth or an illusion. It is not a hypothesis or a hypnotic suggestion. It is the science of enlightenment. Kundalini is a biological substance that exists within, within the framework of the body. So it's a substance that has not been found by science yet. When Kundalini awakens, not only are you blessed with visions and psychic experiences, you could become a prophet, a saint, inspired artist, or a musician, a brilliant writer or poet, a clairvoyant, or a messiah. Or you could become an outstanding leader, prime minister, etc. The awakening of Kundalini affects the whole area of the human mind and behavior. So the people who are very successful, some people who be, are very successful, like Mahatma Gandhi, had Kundalini awakenings. Everybody should know something about Kundalini as it represents the coming consciousness of mankind. Kundalini is the name of a sleeping, dormant potential force, the human organism, in the, in the human organism, and it is situated at the root of the spinal column. As Kundalini ascends, it passes through each of the chakras, which are interconnected with the different silent areas of the brain. With the awakening of Kundalini, there is an explosion in the brain as the dormant or sleeping areas start blossoming like flowers. Therefore, Kundalini can be equated with the awakening of the silent areas of the brain. Once the multi petaled lotus of Sahasrara blossoms, that's the crown chakra, a new consciousness dawns. Our present consciousness is not independent, as the mind depends on the information supplied by the senses. If you have no eyes, you can never see. If you are deaf, you will never hear. However, when the super consciousness emerges, experience becomes completely independent and knowledge also becomes completely independent. Whatever happens in spiritual life, it is related to the awakening of Kundalini. And the goal of every form of spiritual life, whether you call it Samadhi, Nirvana, Moksha, Communion, Union, Liberation, or whatever, is in fact awakening of Kundalini. When Kundalini has just awakened and you are not able to handle it, that's called Kali. When you can handle it and are able to use it for beneficial purposes and become powerful on account of it, it is called Durga. Darkness and death are by no means the mere absence of blight and life. Rather, they are their origin. In the tantric texts, Kundalini is conceived as the primal power or energy. Prana has no form or dimension. It is infinite. So prana is life force, and kundalini is the energy found in your, spinal, in your spine. So prana is actually more of a breath. It's what, it's what keeps you alive, but kundalini is the spiritual energy. There's three types of experience. There's a subjective experience, sensual experience, and absence of experience. Everybody, whether you're a householder or a monk, must remember that awakening of Kundalini is the prime purpose of human incarnation, or being human. All the pleasures of sensual life, which we are enjoying now, are intended only to enhance the awakening of Kundalini amidst the adver adverse circumstances of man's life. With the awakening of Kundalini, a transformation takes place in life. It has little to do with one's moral, religions, religious, or ethical life. It has more to do with the quality of our experiences and perceptions. When Kundalini wakes up, your mind changes and your priorities and attachments also change. All your karmas undergo a process of integration. There is even the possibility of restructuring the entire physical body. If you want to awaken Kundalini in order to enjoy communion between God and the body, uh, well, Shiva, so Shiva, God, or oneness, and Shakti is movement, or the world. So these two forces together is awakening. The actual communion between the two great forces within you, and if you want to enter Samadhi and experience the absolute in the cosmos, 
And if you want to understand the truth behind the appearance, and if the purpose of your, of your pilgrimage is very great, then there is nothing that can come to you as an obstacle. So that's great motivation. Nothing is in the way of you understanding the cosmos. Kundalini, or the serpent power, does not belong to the physical body, though it is connected to it, nor can it be discovered in the mental body or even the astral body. Its abode is actually in the causal body, where the concepts of time, space, and object are completely lost. Therefore, the third eye is the connecting link between the lowest unconscious seat of power and the highest center of illumination within the, within the individual. Kundalini yoga is not abstract. It considers this very physical body as the basis. The chakras are vortices of psychic energy, and they are visualized and experienced as circular movements of energy at particular rates of vibration. These nerve centers are not situated inside the spinal cord itself, but lie like junctions on the interior walls of the spinal column. The sixth and most important chakra corresponds to the pineal gland, that is your third eye right here, lying in the midline of the brain directly above the spinal column. You can think of it as your brain itself. This chakra controls the muscles and the onset of sexual activity in man. Tantra and yoga maintain that Ajna chakra, the command center, has complete control over all functions of, the, of your life. These six chakras serve as switches for turning on different parts of the brain. The awakening which is brought about in the chakras is conducted to higher centers in the brain via the nadis. And we'll look, we'll look at what nadis are in one second. There are also two higher centers in the brain where, which are commonly referred to in kundalini yoga. You have bindu and sahasrara. Bindu is located at the, at the top back of the head where Hindu Brahmins keep a tuft of hair. This is the point where oneness first divides itself into many. Oneness divides itself into many. Bindu feeds the whole optic system and is also the seat of nectar. Sahasrara is better or supreme. It is the final culmination of Kundalini Shakti. Again, Shakti is movement. It is the seat of higher awareness. Sahasrara, again, Sahasrara is crown here, this energy found here, the, the chakra found here, is situated at the top of the head and is physically correlated with the pituitary gland, which controls each and every gland and system of the body. So it's saying this controls your entire body. Nadis, okay, getting back to nadis, are not nerves, but rather channels for the flow of consciousness. So nadis are these channels that science has not discovered yet, but it gives the flow of consciousness. Ida Nadi controls all the mental processes, while the Pingala Nadi controls all the vital processes. Ida is known as moon and Pingala the sun. The third Nadi, nadi called Shishumna, is the channel for awakening spiritual consciousness. So that is why Shishumna is going, going to be the greater. If the of these two energies, life and consciousness, can be made to function simultaneously. Then both hemispheres of the brain can be made to function simultaneously and to participate together in thinking, living, intuitive, and regulating processes. Muladhara chakra, the root chakra, is just like a powerful generator. In order to start this generator, you need some sort of pranic energy, so prana. This prana is generated through pranayama. Pranayama is actually a breathe, is breathing technique such as alternate nostril breathing. So you can look at that, uh, you can Google that, alternate nostril breathing. Awakening of Shishuna is just as important as awakening of Kundalini. I actually don't quite understand the difference, but let's keep going. When there is current flowing in Ida, Pingala, and Shishuna, then enlightenment takes place. So we have Ida. Again, Ida controls the mental processes, and Pingala controls the, the vital processes, and then Shishumna controls the spiritual processes. So mind, body, spirit, together, enlightenment. When, when there is flowing, let's see, let's go back to here. The whole science of Kundalini Yoga 
concerns the awakening of Shishumna. For once Shishumna comes to life, a means of communication between the higher and lower dimensions of consciousness is established, and the awakening of Kundalini occurs. In the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, so the Bhagavad Gita is a, is a Hindu book, there is a description of the imperishable tree, which has its roots on top and the trunk and branches below, going downwards. He who knows this tree knows the truth. Just kind of interesting. That's why I put it in my notes. Not very important for Kundalini, but very, very intriguing. Uh, this tree is existing in the structure and function of the human body and nervous system. One must know and climb this paradoxical tree to arrive at the truth. I just love that one. This tree seems to be completely topsy-turvy, yet it, it contains the essence of all occult truth and secret knowledge. It cannot be understood intellectually, but only through progressive spiritual awakening. For spiritual understanding always dawns in a way which is paradoxical and irrational to the faculty of intellect. Similarly, the silent parts of the brain have prana, not consciousness. So the silent parts of the brain have prana, not consciousness. Each of the chakras is independent. They are not connected with each other. This means if Kundalini Shakti awakens in the root, chak the root chakra, it goes to directly to Sahasrara, the crown chakra, to a particular center in the brain. When the spiritual fluid moves through the vertebral, vertebral column, it alters the phases of consciousness. And this is a very important process as far as evolution is concerned. Kundalini has the ability to activate the human consciousness in such a way that the person can develop his most beneficial qualities, can enter a much more intimate relationship with nature about him, and can become aware of his oneness with the whole cosmos. Again, we are one with the cosmos. The aim of Kundalini Yoga is not really to awaken the power of man, but rather to bring the power down to earth, or to bring the power of the unconscious or higher consciousness to normal consciousness. Okay, so we go, again, to bring the power of Kundalini down to earth, or to bring the power of the unconscious or higher consciousness to normal consciousness. So bring higher consciousness to normal consciousness. This is the purpose of life. This is the purpose of our spiritual journey. That's, that was my little spiel. <laughs> we have no need to awaken the consciousness, for it is ever awake. We have only to gain complete control over our higher conscious forces. It is possible that a new generation of supermen will be produced in this way. Through the practices of yoga, you can transform the quality of your genes. If genes can produce, produce artists, scientists, inventors, and intellectual, intellectual geniuses, then why not awaken kundalini people? You have to transform the quality of your sperm or ova by firstly transforming your whole consciousness. <laughs> the second method of awakening kundalini is through steady, regular practice of mantra. Mantra, 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 mantra. This is a very powerful, smooth, and risk-free method. But of course, it is a sadhana which requires time and a lot of patience. It develops in you the vision of a higher force and enables you to live amidst the sensualities of life with indifference to them. So this is a very Buddhist idea, where you're, you're living as a, an awakened person in this society of desires. When you throw a pebble into a still lake, it produces circular ripples. In the same way, when you repeat a mantra over and over again, the sound force gathers momentum and creates vibrations in the ocean of the mind. The mantra must be chanted loudly, softly, on the mental plane and on the psychic plane. By practicing it at these four levels, Kundalini awakens methodically and systematically. You can also use the mantra by repeating it mentally. The third method of awakening is tap, tapasya, which means the performance of austerities. Tapasya is a means of purification, of burning or setting on fire so that a process of elimination is created. When you want to eliminate a bad habit, the more you want to get rid of it, the more powerful it becomes. When you abandon it in, when you abandon it in the waking, waking state, the waking state, it appears in dreams. 
and when you stop these dreams, it expresses itself in your behavior or manifests in disease. This particular habit must be destroyed at its psychic root. The fifth method of inducing awakening is through Raja Yoga and the development of an equipoised mind. This is the total merging of individual consciousness with super consciousness. Again, the total merging of your consciousness with the super consciousness of, of the cosmos. Concentration of mind is one of the most difficult things for modern man to achieve. Following the awakening through Raja Yoga. So Raja Yoga, today we call that either Kundalini Yoga or Kriya Yoga. Also Tantra. Again, following the awakening through yoga, changes take place in the, in the spiritual practice, practitioner. He may transcend hunger and all his addictions or habits. You're transcending all of your desires. The sensualities of life are no longer appealing. Hunger and sexual urge decrease and detachment develops spontaneously. So yoga brings about a slow transformation of consciousness. The sixth method of awakening kundalini is through pranayama, again, alternate nostril breathing. When a sufficiently prepared practitioner practices pranayama in a calm, cool, and quiet environment, preferably at high altitude, with a diet only sufficient to maintain life, the awakening of kundalini takes place like an explosion. In fact, the awakening is so rapid that kundalini ascends to the crown chakra immediately. So you have to travel to Asia and you have to be in the Himalaya mountains or at least in the Andes mountains. If you want to be at really high altitude, eating very little food and practicing pranayama. Then you will see the truth of the universe. (laughs) Pranayama is not only a breathing exercise or a means to increase prana in the body. It is a powerful method of creating yogic fire to heat the kundalini and awaken it. However, it is practiced without sufficient preparation. This will not occur because the generated heat will not be directed to the proper centers. There are two important ways of awakening kundalini. One is the direct method and the other the indirect. Pranayama is the direct. The experiences it brings about are explosive. Expansion is rapid. However this, however, this form of kundalini awakening is always accompanied, accompanied by certain experiences. And for one who is not sufficiently prepared mentally, philosophically, physically, and emotionally, these experiences can be terrifying. Therefore, although the path of pranayama is a jet-set method, it is drastic and is considered to be a very difficult one that everybody cannot manage. Not, not everyone can manage. The seventh method of inducing awakening is Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga is actually, I practice Kriya Yoga. It is the most simple and practical way for modern day man as it does not require confrontation with the mind. Sattvic people, people who, let's see, sattvic people may be able to awaken Kundalini through Raja Yoga, but those who have a tumultuous, noisy mind will not succeed this way. So sattvic people are people who maybe eat vegan or vegetarian and meditate a lot and avoid too much alcohol and drugs. Um, Okay, when you practice Kriya Yoga, Kundalini doesn't wake up with force, nor does it awaken like a satellite or vision. It wakes up like a noble queen. Sometimes you feel very grand and sometimes you don't feel quite right. Sometimes you pay too much attention to the things of life and sometimes you think everything is useless. The eighth method of awakening kundalini through tantric initiation is a very secret topic. Only those people who have transcended passions and who understand the two principles of nature, Shiva and Shakti, are entitled to this initiation. It is not meant for those who have urges lurking within them or for those who have a need for physical contact. There are no extraordinary experiences or feelings and there are no neurosis. Everything seems quite normal, but at the same time, without your knowledge, awakening is taking place. The ninth method of awakening is performed by the guru called Shaktipat. <laughs> so you can, if you want Shaktipat, Google it and you can find a Shaktipat person on the internet. And it's a way of awakening to Samadhi. But I think it's very expensive. I have not seen the prices. 
Okay, quote, it is very difficult to say who is qualified for Shaktipat, or um, who is qualified to give Shaktipat. You may have lived the life of a renunciate for 50 years, but still you may not get it. You may be just an ordinary person. This evolution is not intellectual, emotional, social, or religious. It is spiritual evolution, which has nothing to do with the way you live, eat, behave, or think. Because generally, we do these things not because of our evolvement, but according to the way we have been brought up and educated. Don't aspire for awakening. Let it happen if it happens. I am not responsible for the awakening. Nature is accomplishing everything. I accept what comes to me. This is known as the path of self-surrender. And in this path, if you have a strong enough belief that your kundalini will indeed awaken, 20,000 years can pass in the twinkling of an eye and kundalini will awaken instantly. So one thing that I've learned about spirituality is that the cosmos or the cosmic consciousness awakens itself up to itself through you. <laughs> so you do, do not become enlightened. The universe becomes enlightened through you. And that is why you have to surrender, 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 let go, let go, let go, if enlightenment is for you. Okay, next we have karma yoga and bhakti yoga are considered comparatively safe and mild methods of awakening. But the tantric methods are more scientific than the non-tantric methods. So what we're reading here is called tantric methods. So kundalini awakening is tantric. And here, a very, very important. Without a guru, you can practice any form of yoga, but not kundalini yoga. If you want kundalini yoga, you have to find a teacher. Very important. This is an extremely powerful system. Kundalini yoga does not start suddenly or with fits. Do not start with advanced practices. Do not start with advanced practices. For some time, you should train and prepare the physical body. Then go to the mind and gradually explore the deeper levels. Before commencing the practices which bring about the actual awakenings of Kundalini, you must prepare yourself step by step on the physical, mental, and emotional planes. If you are patient and prepare correctly, awakening of Kundalini will definitely take place. So prepare, prepare the mind, prepare the body, prepare the heart. Then you're, you have potential to uh, engage in Kundalini awakenings. Adequate preparation is necessary to ensure that one has the strength to bear the impact of full awakening of the mighty potential force within. Therefore, before Kundalini awakens, it is important that you are able to manage the mind. If you can maintain a balanced mind in the face of mental and emotional conflicts, and you can endure anger, worry, love, passion, disappointment, uh, etc., you are ready for the awakening. If you can still feel joy when the scales are heavily loaded against you, you are an aspirant for Kundalini Yoga. So you need to be like a stoic. A stoic. Before you awaken Kundalini Shakti, you must be able to merge yourself with the higher spirit. And you must know how to utilize the creative energy of Kundalini. It is absolutely essential, essential to have a guru with whom you feel intimate. Many people say the guru is within, but are they able to communicate with him, understand him, and follow his intricate instructions? He will be there if you need any advice, and he will guide you through the crisis of awakening. <laughs> the crisis of awakening. I <laughs> love that. Usually, because we are religious-minded people, our relationship with, guru, with the guru is based on a sort of formality. To us, he is worshipful, respectful, superior, and supreme. But the time of awakening, all these attitudes to guru must be set aside. So this is that was more of a warning for people from Asia. Americans, I don't think you have to worry about that. You're not gonna, you're not gonna have a tendency to worship your guru. Um, but I think actually we need to, actually we have the opposite problem. We need to we need to have more worship towards enlightened beings. Because uh, that's that's a that's a side of ourselves that we need to open ourselves up to, as Americans and Europeans, we are not a we, we are kind of turned off uh, at worshiping other people, because we think that we we think that we assume that they are God or something. Okay, but that's 
everybody's God. So everyone's worth worth worshiping. But especially if that person is is knowledgeable of their nature. Okay. He will be there if oh see, let's go down. The relationship between guru and disciple is the most intimate of relationships. It is neither religious nor legal. Even with his human body, we still have animal in us, so that these natural urges follow us. Let them, but remember, this body is not for their fulfillment alone. So that's heavy. Okay, so the human body is still animalistic, but uh, let, let those animalistic urges enter. Let them enter completely. Allow them, give them space. Give them space to either grow or shrink because those animalistic behaviors are God. So let them go. If you don't let them in and become you, then you will not become enlightened. Again, let them. But remember, this body is not for the fulfillment alone. So our bodies are for, our bodies are ultimately for, for enlightenment, not for sensual pleasures. So that's the mistake that we have when we are born. We're taught that our bodies are for sensual pleasures. But they are actually the, the vessel or the boat or the car, the vehicle that's going to carry us to enlightenment. If you are eager to awaken Kundalini, you should not be in a hurry. Set apart 12 years of your life for this purpose. 12 years of your life to awaken Kundalini. When one is in possession of a weak mind, which cannot sustain even a little bit of cheerfulness or excitement, or bear the death of a spouse or separation from a loved one, how can he sustain the tremendous force of an awakened Kundalini? So if you cannot withstand anything in life, so if you cannot withstand everything in life, then you're not ready for Kundalini awakening. Kundalini awakening is going to be the most difficult thing in your life. So you have to prepare yourself. You have to prepare um, yourself for your entire family dying, for your own death, most importantly, for, for, for your own death, for the death of your children, um, for losing all of your money, for having intense pain, for losing parts of your body, for getting cancer. You have to transcend any of those and if you want a kundalini awakening. Okay. You must also undergo purification or elements and purification of the chakras. Otherwise, when kundalini awakenings, there will be a traffic jam. Okay, so you have to awaken each chakra. You have to awaken one by one each chakra. Once every chakra is, is awakened, sorry, is opened. I was saying awakened. Awakened or opened. I use the term opened. So each chakra opens up and you can feel it. For example, I've had my heart chakra open up. Um, and that's an amazing experience. <laughs> uh, it's just infinite love. Um, so each chakra becomes is opened up, then that's when Kundalini ascends from the root chakra all the way up to the crown chakra and explodes into the universe. That's theoretically how it happens. I've never experienced that myself. Start with purification of, of your chakras by doing regular yoga. So regular physical yoga. That's, that's step one. So kind of take two years to do to do regular yoga and prepare your body. And then you can move maybe into mind type meditations. Start with, pure, let's see, if, if experience commence before you are properly prepared, you should immediately start to prepare yourself. The first thing to do is start fasting or switch to a light diet. So you have to switch your diet from meat, <laughs> meat heavy, or even eating too much. You should also live quietly and avoid social interactions. So if you really want to get enlightened, you have to completely change your life. You have to find a, a job where you're not going to communicate with people for 5 to 12 years. You have to really, really focusing, focus on awakening yourself. Um, I think there are other methods to become enlightened. This is just, again, this is one method. Very, very important. Um, but this is, again, this is the science of enlightenment. Kundalini is the science of enlightenment. It is going to be the fastest and most effective uh, method. Another method you can do is Zen. Zen usually takes 
uh, it might take 30 or 40 years for you to see your enlightenment. And that's with meditating between two and four hours every day. Okay, with Kundalini, you can do it with a, a teacher. Or with, uh, if you want to do Kriya Yoga, you do that for two hours every day. And maybe in 30 or 40 years, you become enlightened. If you minimize your interactions with the world outside, the experiences will subside after five or six days, and you can resume your normal life. You should then start searching for someone who can give you further guidance. When you know that Kundalini is arousing as soon as you can, you should retire to a congenial place. As far as I know, the only congenial place is an ashram. <laughs> uh, so if, when enlightenment is happening, it's very, very important to do that in a monastery or a church or in the woods, maybe. But with, with someone who has experienced what you have experienced so that they can explain it to you. Otherwise, it's going to be extremely scary. Again, I have not experienced any of this. This is just me reading the book. If you stay with your family during the crisis period, so crisis is the, uh, is the awakening, you may, they may send you off to a mental hospital. So again, this is why Kundalini can be extremely dangerous if you don't do it properly. Because um, also people will just perceive you as crazy because people don't know what Kundalini is. Um, for, for example, if you don't feel like eating one particular day, your family might ask, oh, you're not eating today? And when they see you haven't eaten for a few days, they'll say something is wrong with him. So that's an example from the book. Okay, if you are, if you are an intellectual like me, then read books, talk minimally, minimally, and practice Hatha yoga. So Hatha yoga is the physical yoga. And fast from time to time. If you are a very active person, work hard and dedicate yourself to karma yoga. Okay, so very important. So I'm an intellectual person. I am not, I'm not a hard worker. So that means I should, to become enlightened, it says I should read books and talk very little <laughs> and do Hatha yoga. Um, right now, I don't do any of those. Um, I think books are overrated. I don't think you learn much from books. Um, you actually only retain about 10% from ten percent of information when you read it just once. Also, talking is an extremely important. Talk, um, but talking about philosophy. Talking about philosophy is important. Talking about your day is not important. Talking about philosophy is extremely important. So that's when you learn how to... Okay, okay I'm not reading. It's very important I'm not reading. Um, this is my opinion. Uh, when you talk about philosophy... That's when you get to learn about your opinions and what you get to learn what you know and what you don't know. And what you don't know, you want to study that. And you study it by going on the internet, not by reading books. Um, unless you find a book on the internet that's, that's the only way to learn something, learn a particular idea, then you can order that book. But really, the, the internet is the best place to learn. Specifically, you, YouTube um, and podcasts. So reading, you're not going to learn much. Uh, it's only 10%. Unless you read it three or four times, then you might know 30 or 40%. Okay, but with a, a video, um, watch it twice, you're going to understand 50% of it. Um, if you listen to a podcast, very good. So that is why I do a vodcast. So a vodcast is like a, it's your, it's like a podcast plus. So you're learning, you're going to learn more, especially if you keep your eyes on the video. But... In my podcast here, in my podcast here, you can probably set your phone down and just listen, and you're learning more than if you were reading this book. That's exactly why I'm doing this video, is because you are learning much, much more by listening to me, um, so, uh, listening to me read it with my voice, and then I'm doing a little bit of an analysis. So that's why you're learning more like 40% instead of 10% from this book. So now. Luckily, because of my effort, you don't need to go and read this book. Okay, let's continue. Regarding pranayama, when the experience is moving onwards, pranayama happens by itself. You don't have to think what to do. So as your, as your spiritual journey continues, it's, it turns from doing things to being. So that's why we have to focus on being. 
So you don't have to worry. Just follow the flow of experience and take care of your environment and food and make sure nobody disturbs you. So that is how you become a spiritual person. Again, not worry. Follow the flow of experience. Take care of your house and your yard and whatever and your food and make sure nobody disturbs you. So if you want to become an enlightened person, uh, live by yourself or with one other person that gives you space and doesn't talk to you too much. Um, and don't socialize too much. Very important. Once you become enlightened, now that's your opportunity opportunity to socialize and to have a career and, and to have a successful career. So that's why I suggest that you try to become enlightened first before trying to have a successful career. Don't do the reverse because your career would not actually give you happiness. So what you want is to learn what happiness, happiness is and then go do that. <laughs> so becoming enlightened is how you learn about happiness. Um, I'm myself not enlightened. That's my ultimate goal in life. Uh, it's one of my ultimate goals. Actually, it is my first goal is to become enlightened because once I become enlightened and then I can figure out what's next. Um, but I, I'm learning more about happiness. So happiness is, is, is the precursor to enlightenment. So when you're, you, you are having more and more and more happiness in your life, you know, for a fact that you're heading towards enlightenment. Okay. That was my little spiel. If you do not follow the path of karma yoga, your evolution will definitely be retarded at some point. Um, so at some point you have to work hard, but I would say that you have to learn about your spiritual self first. Next we have, life has to be disciplined so that when Kundalini awakens, you can remain unconfused. You have to go to the office, the bank, shops, and drive a car. Everybody cannot become a swami or stay in an ashram. So what is your dharma? Your dharma is your life calling. Excuse me. And your life calling comes from the universe, and that's why you have to do it. <laughs> if you want to live in truth and happiness and health and love. Um, not everybody's life purpose is to be a teacher. It just happens to be mine. Um, that is why I'm here, <laughs> is for the reason of the universe. That's the, I, I feel called to do this. Next, accept in tant tantric initiation. The sexual obligations have to be kept at bay. So kept away. Um, sexual obligations. Uh, so, f and I'll, so next, sh food should be minimum light and pure. So these are just desires. These are bodily desires that we have. Sex, food, sleep, and socializing. Those are kind of the main ones. Those, you have to not focus on them too much when you are becoming enlightened. At first, in your in the initial stages of your of your enlightened of your spiritual journey, you're going to these are going to be difficult to overcome, very very difficult. Uh, I am definitely not overcome these bodily obligations or desires by any means, um, but I'm becoming much better at it. Uh, and basically, they're the, and eventually I can see that they're not going to be a problem in my life. It's just that I'm, I'm improving day by day on these bodily, bodily desires. Um, but I see that they're not me. So the bodily desires comes from the body and I'm not the body. And I learned that through, by meditating. So very important. So get more and more into your meditation. And don't ever stop meditating during the day. When you're at work, when you're at school, when you're socializing, never stop meditating. So again, that's that's why I believe that you can move, 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 and be still, still, still at the same time. Next. <clears throat> Often when Kundalini awakens in a person, he develops some sort of power. Okay, so here. This is when we have to open up our minds to what Kundalini has to offer at this point of the book. This is where, this is the point of the book that I became where... I saw the infinite possibilities of life and that the world is not a Newtonian material world. Okay. Uh, he develops some sort of power. Some, some practitioners can materialize things. They can see clair clairvoyantly 
or they can hear clairaudiently. So you can see things and hear things that aren't physically there. Some people can read the minds of others. Let me repeat that. When, as, as you develop in your spiritual awakening, you will have the ability to read the minds of others. Okay. Of, of course, science cannot explain this, but that's the experience of people who are very, very developed in their spiritual practice. When you are amongst many people, it becomes a great temptation to exercise these powers. Uh, these are called cities. These powers are called cities. And this can be dangerous. So cities can be very dangerous because you can... Um, have again it says the the temptation to do harm and to have when when you have the sit power of cities it can um, drive your ego it can it can give pleasure to your ego to kind of um, control your outside world so that's why i i would say i'm preparing myself to not dive into those cities not dive into those like mind those mind, those powers of mind that can control the physical world. I'm going to try to go beyond those and just let people live their lives. I don't want to mess with people unless it's advantageous for them. For example, if you have the knowledge of who's, who lost their car keys, right? You help them out. Next, <clears throat> when awakening takes place by mantra, you will have to adjust your diet and retire from sexual obligations. Not permanently, just, just for a while. From time to time, it is also beneficial if you enter total seclusion. Twice a year is sufficient. So this is called Vipassana. Vipassana. You might want to go on a Vipassana retreat twice a year, where you are in a 10-day uh, silent retreat. Um, I have never done those. Um, I have only done a silent retreat. Um, meditation at home um, where I, I didn't work for the whole day and I meditated the whole day in silence. Um, I actually didn't even make it the whole day. So I want to prepare myself for doing a 10-day silent retreat and doing this twice a year. Very important. During your first day of seclusion, observe silence and take only very light food and very, very light food and very little of it. Do not meditate or try to concentrate. From morning until evening with a few breaks here and there, only practice your mantra. Don't do it with exertion or strain. And if you become introverted, stop it. Maintain your mental concept with the external experiences. So this is, this is uh, talking about mantra. If you want to do a, um, like a mantra vacation, that's what you do on your first day. Um... And you want to start with one day. Then it says you want to go, eventually move on to between three and nine days of that. Um, but you have to work up from one day to three days to nine days. Uh, seclusion is actually recommended for all of those who are under, undergoing awakening of Kundalini. At that time, it is best to retire from active life and family environments for at least 45 days. Uh, so if you are serious about awakening, awakening your Kundalini, you have to avoid any social or from family obligations. Uh, here's an example. Sadhus live in seclusion because when there are interactions with people, so many thought currents move in the mind. So as you can tell, other, peop other people, they help your mind move. They in increase activity in your brain. And that's what you don't want when you're on your spiritual journey. Um, eventually, you're going to have to integrate integrate both. You're going to have to integrate your spiritual life and your work and social life together, but we're not, we're not ready for that yet. Um, you have to do one by one. You have to become, search for enlightenment first, and once you become pr as enlightened as you want, then you jump back into social life. Next, when the awakening of Kundalini takes place, it is important to have the correct diet, as food can influence the mind and your nature. At the time of awakening, certain physiological changes occur in the body, particularly in the digestive system. And the digestive process is frequently disturbed. Next, scientific observations have shown that the awakening of Kundalini is generally accompanied by a state of nervous depression. Do not live to eat, but eat to live. So, it's a quote from the book. <laughs> 
The food we eat is not merely to satisfy our taste. Every food item has an essence. And yoga, we call it sattva. Sattva means the ultimate essence of food. Please do not make the mistake this for vitamins or minerals. Sattva is a more subtle form of food. Uh, sattva is S-A-T-T-V-A. Something that would be very interesting to Google. When the thoughts are fed with sattva, they are more refined and pure, and one is able to live in higher consciousness. Therefore, it is beneficial to fast from time to time. Next, we have bhakti, a bhakta yogi, a person who does bhakti yoga or devotional yoga. So that's when you're devoting yourself to either a guru or God. Let's see, and uh. A bo- uh, they can eat all types of sweets and confectionery, consume cheese, butter, and milk, and etc., and can eat because their metabolism is fast. Next, for one who is serious about yoga and spiritual aspiration, diet is as important as yoga. Yoga and diet, what you eat is what you are, right? The awakening of Kundalini is a very important, pleasant, and historical experience in the life of man. If you can see and experience something more than what you can generally see and experience through your senses, you are indeed fortunate. But at the same time, if you have such experiences without adequate preparation, you may be startled, frightened, and confused. Therefore, before the actual awakening of Kundalini, it is better to experience some mild awakenings in the chakras first. So a mild awakening, I can tell you about mine. Um, This past summer, my heart chakra opened. Um, at the time, I didn't think it was mild. <laughs> I thought it was extreme. But as you keep going, you'll learn that what you think is extreme is actually mild when you compare it to the entire universe. Uh, what I felt was that my heart became the environment. I was sensing the heart energy of other people and the environment. So not just people, but I was, I loved my environment because it was like what I was. Um, So I thought that was very profound, but it was quite a mild experience. And that happened this summer. And that's why I started reading this book. I wanted to figure out what opening a heart chakra was, what it was, what, what was it? Why did it happen? What do I do next? Okay. Um, Just a few more I'm going to read a few few more uh, sentences from this book, and we'll keep this at about an hour. So let's find something that is going to blow your mind. Uh, it says, when the, body is to- in- when the body in totality is purified by the practices of Hatha Yoga, and when the mind is purified by mantra, when the pranas are brought under control through practices of pranayama, and your diet is pure and like a yogi, at that time, a waking of kundalini can take place without danger or accident. So you have to prepare the body, prepare the mind, and prepare the heart in order for you to see truth. Very important. Awakening of Kundalini is one of the greatest events in the life of a yogi. It is the destiny of mankind, so why not go ahead with it? So the the argument is that you are going to become enlightened at some point, Maybe not this life, but in your future. So why not in this life? Well, maybe not. Maybe it's too soon for you, but eventually it's going to happen. So why not do it now? That's the argument. Let's find one more here. I want to find one that might blow your mind. You may hear or experience many inexplicable things, but they are all simply products of your own unconscious mind and should be regarded as nothing more. With the awakening of psychic consciousness, the symbols belonging to your own personality come out. So you're going to have, you might begin to have more psychic powers once you have kundalini awakenings. So you have, but again, those are called cities. But I think you have to try to ignore the cities as much as you can because they're going to be a distraction from you going more and more towards awakening. All right. Well, that's all I can see for now. Um, And I'm still going to end this video right at one hour. Great. 
So if you like the video, comment below, like it. Uh, the more that you like these videos, they get shared out so that people can learn more and more about Kundalini, um, truth, enlightenment, being, philosophy. These are the ideas that we need to spread to ourselves. Okay, what is humanity? It is us. What is the earth? It is us. What is us? It is I. <laughs> it is your I. It is his I. I, I, I is us. These are. That's why... Everything is just connected. And if everything is connected, we need to have happiness, be and happiness and love and being and consciousness. These are the values and not just the values, but the living entities that we want to share amongst ourselves. That's it for today. Peace.